and it was expected that as a sign of solidarity to their Soviet masters that Mojinita and, and Carmen would be expected to, to, to lose the game. And her exact quote was to demonstrate to the Romanian public the unquestionable superiority of Soviet man. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. The Chinese army, the Chinese police are advancing through the city from a variety of directions on Tiananmen Square at the heart of the city where the student demonstrators for democracy have been for so long. Astonishing news from East Germany where the East German authorities have said in essence that the Berlin Wall doesn't mean anything anymore. There is a clear sign tonight that hardline Czechoslovakia now is beginning to give that it is feeling the dramatic changes taking place in next door East Germany. This is Radio Bucharest, Romania. This is Radio Bucharest, Romania. Listeners following by great popular manifestations in the capital city of Romania, Bucharest, today, December 22nd, 1989, the dictatorial regime of Nicolae Ceausescu was overthrown. In this episode, we hear from Craig McCracken, who spoke to us in episode three. This time he tells us about the strange world of football in Cold War Romania. And even if you are not interested in football, it's a fascinating chat about Cold War Romania. Craig runs the website beyondthelastman.com, described as 20th century football writing and nostalgia in a skilled and cultured groove. He really knows his football history. Are you liking the podcast and want to help? Well, for the price of a couple of coffees a month, you can help cover the show's increasing costs and keep us on the air. Plus, you get that sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster too. Just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. So, back to today's episode. We talk of the early Cold War years where pre-war clubs were dissolved in favour of the big two, through to the societal breakdown of the 1980s with defections, corruption, zombie clubs and an unlikely European Cup success. I'm delighted to welcome back Craig McCracken to our Cold War conversation. At the end of the war, it was still the country was still a, a constitutional monarchy. Um, but I think 1946, the communists won the elections, or they, they fixed the elections to win to win them with the help of, of the Soviets. Um, a year later, by 1947, um, King Mitchell, who Mitchell, who was the son of King Carol, um, who had abdicated during the war, he was forced to abdicate, uh, abdicate, and he he left the country. And um, yes, by, by 1948, essentially, the, the country was fully under communist control and they started to break down all of the, the pre-war institutions and um, following the typical communist playbook of, um, of uh, the mass nationalizations and uh, systemization of, uh, in, uh, of uh, agriculture and, and, and the likes, yes. Right. So did did that apply the same to sport as well? So did they dismantle those um the the pre-war clubs? Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, again, followed the model that was typical across all of all of Eastern Europe really. There was this um overwhelming desire to to um to rinse away the past, rinse away the history and with Romanian Clubs that um, they were all kind of private concerns. There was uh, supported by business. They were uh, essentially professional capitalist as well. So there was a desire to um, yeah to, to, to wipe them from from history. So we saw uh, a loss of pre-war clubs, and the way it was done was was sort of typical um, communist um, chick really. A new law came in that dictated that all sports organisations had to join a trade union or a government institution so that there could be no such thing as a private sporting club. Uh, so uh, I so, think you know, there's a famous club called Juventus Bucharest um, and they, they were moved to Ploeste and they became Petrolo, a club of the, uh, the oil workers. And Venus, who we talked about, of course, um, they had a fairly inauspicious ending to, to their life they were forced to, to, to be able to retain a license and be able to play. They were forced to merge with a club 
that uh, were called, a progressive club called UCB. And UCB were a minor, minor club, and they were the club of the sewer workers of, of Bucharest. Uh, but they were, <laughs> they were a government institution. So Venus were forced to merge with those uh, uh, in 1948, I think that was. But then I, I don't think the club's heart was in it and the club just folded totally in, in 1949. Right. So it's, um, the, the, there was, I mean, I think the most um, telling story about that uh, very awkward uh, tra- difficult transformation um, in the immediate post-war year from what was a quasi-capitalist democracy to authoritarian, authoritarian communist state was was the story of uh, Carmen Bucharest. Now, Carmen Bucharest was a, a fairly new club. It was formed um, just in 1937 on the, on the outskirts of Bucharest, and um, it was a sporting extension of the um, Mocionita, uh, probably excuse my pronunciation there, actually, a footwear company, and this was a company that was the the biggest, um, the leading producer of shoes and boots in interwar Romania. So, so it was a sizable concern they exported abroad as uh, as well. So there, the, the patron of this company was was a man called Dimitru uh, Motunita, and um, he saw football as as a good way of promoting his uh, his business in very much the sort of type of business model that we we see to to this day. So um, there was no organised football during the war, of course, but there was there was friendlies were played. He put his son in charge, and um, his son was a lawyer, a kind of charismatic lawyer called Yonel, a uh, bon viveur and a football fan, and he started to assemble a, a crack team of some of the, the best uh, players in Romania um, uh, of, of the, 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 during the, the war era. So then we got to, we reached the end, end of the war, of course, and... The, the communists took over, and the Mojinitos were uh, avowedly anti-communists. And the first clash that they had with the new authorities was um, with uh, Anna Poker. Anna Poker was, I suppose, quite a, a notable Romanian historical figure because she was um, the first uh, female foreign minister of, of any country in the world ever, <laughs> and she was very high up in the Communist Party in the, in the post-war years. Anyway, uh, Soviets, the Soviet Dinamo Tbilisi side were touring, and it was a victory victory tour at the end of, of the war, and they were going to come to play Carmen in, in Bucharest. So Anna Polka met up with uh, Mocinita and uh, basically explained to him that... Um, the, um, that this game was, would take place and it was expected that as a sign of solidarity to the Soviet masters uh, that um, the, the yes, the, the, that Montenegro and, and Carmen would be expected to, to, to lose the game <laughs> and her exact quote was to demonstrate to the Romanian public the unquestionable superiority of Soviet man that was her precise quote so Bocinita wasn't happy with this at all. I mean, he, he was happy to play the game. He was happy to pay the travel expenses of the visitors, but he, he refused point blank to acquiesce with the request to go out and deliberately lose. So the game didn't happen. Tbilisi preferred not to play the game rather than uh, come along and play and potentially lose. Uh, so this meant that Bocinita had his card marked by, by, the, by, the, by the, the new government, of course, and uh, they would have probably liked to have um, abolished Carmen at that point, but um, it was kind of difficult it was difficult because Carmen had just won promotion with their star team in their first full season to, to League One. And um, with all the of the internationals playing and with all the star, star names, it would have been very difficult politically to, to disband them. So Carmen ended up having one season at the top and they finished runners-up in, in the division. And um, finally, the government found the pretext that needed to disband them. And it was, a, it was a derby game. They were playing another Bucharest team called Chocano, which I believe translates as Hammer, Hammer Bucharest. And um, they were winning, Carmen were winning the game 6-0. And they had a, a player called Basil Marianne, who was a, a star, a maverick forward of, of the day. And um, he scored a goal where he... he he dribbled past the number of players and the keeper and he stopped in the line, sat in the ball and shielded his eyes as if seeking out an opponent to come and stop and score him. <laughs> so 
the newspapers jumped on this. This was seen as showboating, um, and it was humiliation of their opponents. The club was labelled a circus and the nest of enemies of, of the sports. So it was a fabricated outrage behind the scenes. The, the Romanian Federation met in the close season, uh, exacted revenge on, on Carmen, and um, re- refused them the place in the league, and the club was, was um, immediately dissolved. So um, we'll talk about what happened to the players in the club in, in, in the seconds when we, we come on to the, the, the new clubs that were formed. But um, the, a number of players defected, a number of players left, and, and most of the players left joined other clubs as, as well. The, the Mochinitas, the, the father and son, had numerous opportunities to, to leave the country uh, because their safety was not guaranteed by this point, but they passed up those opportunities. Um, shortly afterwards, all their assets were seized and nationalised, and the pair of them were handed lengthy jail sentences, um, which they were forced to sell, uh, serve in uh, really appalling conditions. Uh, Dimitri, the father, caught pneumonia, and he died in jail in 1953. I think he was about in his mid-60s. Uh, the son, Yonel, he served seven years in jail, um, and he was, he was eventually released but he refused to demand that he spied for the authorities in unmasking bourgeois influences within his former social circle. So he stayed in, he was a prisoner, essentially, in, in Bucharest for the next 15 years. And his every move was tracked by the Securitat um, until he was finally allowed to emigrate to Canada in 1970. And uh, I suppose it was a happy ending. He did re- return to Romania following the 1989 revolution. Right, right. And you you mentioned that new clubs were formed, um, and uh, so are they some of the names that we'd be familiar with nowadays? Well, absolutely. Uh, the, the two, I mean, the two new clubs who emerged uh, in the post-war years, the two majors, and they're still the major clubs to this day, are Dinamo Bucharest, who were the team of the the police and the the, the secret the secret police and the minister Ministry of the Interior. And uh, Stewa Bucharest. Now, I just, I'm just going to emphasise the pronunciation because I think people, have, I think through various uh, television commentators over the years, have uh, pronounced pronounced them as Stoya, which is how it reads to us in English: S T A S T E A U A. And I think that's that's stuck. But the actual pronunciation in, in Romanian is Stewa Bucharest because uh, apparently Stoya. Uh, if you say Stoyer in Romanian, it is a, a slang word for male genitalia. So you probably don't really want to Brilliant. Do well, I'm, I'm glad you pronounced uh, those really. names before I did, because I would have made that elementary mistake. <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, that's OK. You're very welcome. And Stoyer, uh, they, were the, they became the army club, essentially. And, and this was very much the same model that we saw across Eastern Europe. Uh, with 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 the police and, and the army having the, being the major clubs of, of influence as well, so um, they and still were, I mean, Dinamo Bucharest were a merged team. There a couple of uh, significant um, pre-war clubs, uh, Unirea Chicola and Chocano, who I mentioned a moment ago. Bucharest they merged and they became Dinamo. Uh, still were, were a totally new club. And they inherited Carmen Bucharest's um, place in the top division when Carmen were liquidated, and many of their players as well. So they got uh, very much a, a, a running start in, in, in their, their career. Right. But of course, with, the benefits with with as with any of the army teams um, was that they could they could call up talented players uh, to play to serve their national service there. And it was attractive for players because um, if they went to serve their national service playing for Stewart then they wouldn't actually ever do anything military, <laughs> military, military, military yeah. wise. Uh, they would just basically play sports, yeah. of course. And you always had the prospect of foreign travel when, when you were playing playing for one of the, ma- the major clubs as well. So it was it was a, it was a, an a pro- uh, it was an appealing prospect. And the club was actually the club in Stewart. They, they they became Stewart in 1959, I think. Actually, they started out as ASA, which was the army. Bucharest and then we came CCA Bucharest that we'll, we'll probably touch upon as well that, that kind of communist habit of um, wanting to rename their clubs uh, almost every single season into something totally different yeah. as well but yeah they became they became still as we know them today and as they become known today though even that's complex and we'll touch upon that later 
uh, from the late 1950s. And um, and those two would uh, create a, something of a duopoly. And it became an absolute duopoly by the 1980s. But in the early years, they, they were the most significant clubs. But there, there were other forces in the remaining game in the post-war years. Too. Right, right. And you, you mentioned travel. So were, were these sides playing in European competitions? Well, European competition started uh, roughly the mid 1950s, and um, so the remaining clubs were active from a from a fairly early stage. But um, I mean, it, football was there was a kind of insularity that um, sort of dominated the remaining mentality when it, when it came to football. Um, and for certainly the 50s and most of, of the 1960s, um, I mean, there was a, a real suspicion um, because of the kind of capitalist professionalism of, of the, the game had uh, undergone in the pre-war years as well. So, um, so in 1958, there was an example where uh, you know, severe punishments were handed down for when it was proven that um, certain footballers had, had been paid and 20 sports stars were, were, were banned for, for life. So, and of course, Romanian, their focus, sporting focus was, again, like a lot of the Eastern Bloc on, on Olympic sports. And um, Romania had... Um, from those early years, had a very, very good tradition in uh, sports like gymnastics and weightlifting, and um, so that, I mean that became very much the priority. I, I, I think, and football was was pushed to to one side in, 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 in many respects. It changed a little bit. I mean, CC and CCA, Stewa, as as, we, as it became known, they toured in England in 1955, and that was the first time a Romanian club had truly toured abroad. And um, I think it was accepted that um, if football was to develop, then they did need external influences, and um, that it, it was seen as as a, as a positive thing. But uh, yeah, the fifties and sixties weren't especially a auspicious uh, decades for for the game in Romania at all. Okay. Okay, I mean, it's almost like uh, there are similarities there with East Germany, with the emphasis on Olympic sport which is probably more able to be influenced, I guess, than a bigger team sport like football? Well, absolutely. Uh, I mean, you can dope footballers as much as uh, as you like, and it's not going to make them pass the ball better or head the ball better. Uh, and the athletic, sure, athletic and cardiovascular enhancements can only take you so far in football. It helps, of course, and... and Doping was was rife uh, in football, and, and to be honest, in Western Europe as well during during these years. Because I mean, there's big question marks against uh, the West German team who won the 1954 World Cup against against uh, against Hungary, and um, the, 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 the came to light about doping and, and how the, the players were were given amphetamines and suffered severely from from jaundice as well. So it wasn't exclusively an Eastern European thing, but um, mm. Yeah, yeah, certainly with um, the, the, the Olympic sports and, and, and individual sports, they were they were much easier to manipulate for political gain than, than football ever was. Yeah, yeah. So into so we've sort of covered the forties and the fifties. So in in the sixties, that your was there more uh, participation in international football then, or was that? Not until really under Ceausescu in the 1970s. Well, Ceausescu took over as general secretary of the Communist Party uh, 1965. I think it, maybe it was about 1967 before he he finally took control of all of the levers of power um, and started developing his uh, infamous cult of personality, of course. And um, and he he himself wasn't a, a football man um, at all, um, but. Almost by by accident, he happened to stumble uh, into a time when Romanian football was on the rise, and and there was a lot of talented, the natural talent. Um, and, and what you started to see was changes happening a little bit under Ceausescu in, in the kind of late sixties uh, and nineteen seventy was was a kind of key a key year for the game. But um, I mean, just come back to Ceausescu. I mean, he. It's, it's easy to forget now, but of course, in his early years, he was seen as almost like a force for good uh, by the West, uh, as a, a moderating force, because obviously he was um, quite unique in the Eastern Bloc, because he con- condemned the um, 
the invasion of, of Prague, the, the, the Prague Spring in the, in the 19, uh, 1968 spring, when obviously Soviet and tanks rolled in uh, to put down a, a, an uprising there. And um, yeah, he, he condemned that as well. And um, of course, the West, Americans and, 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 and Britain saw him as somebody that they could work with. And um, and to that, and he was very close, very close to the French as, as well. Actually, they, the French loved them for, for for some curious reason, and we even managed to the number of times they entertained him and his, his very curious wife Elena that we, we will, I'm sure, talk talk about. But anyway, in his early years, were actually there was some liberalisation um, from what what had gone on before. Uh, that didn't last very long, but um, in the, in a footballing form, he was happy to let open up the borders for players to move abroad when they reach the age of 32 and, and play out the last couple of years of their career in, in their friendly country. So France was a very friendly country. Uh, so a number of players went to France and went to Turkey, Belgium. And this was, again, uh, we talked about this in the East German episode. They, they, well, most countries allowed this. This was their kind of one... Uh, pay off to players if you keep your head down, um, kept quiet, did your duty, you know, served your country, played, played with distinction, then we'll let you have a couple of years at the end of your career where you make some money abroad, uh, but with very strict age, age limits put on. So mm-hmm. from 1968 to 73, that that, start, that happened with Romanians. You started to see Romanians go abroad. But the problem was that um, as soon as most of them went abroad, they, they kind of quite preferred it there. And um, Try to find whatever reasons that they could not not to come back as well. So that that liberalisation shut down fairly fairly quickly. But 1970 was a significant year because Romania qualified for the World Cup, and it was the first World Cup that they had participated in since uh, what well, was 1938. And they had a, a very talented team with um, you know, players like Mircea Lucescu, who won and still is a, uh, one of the, the greatest coaches that the team's produced, but he was a, a fine player as well. And Romania were joining England's group in Mexico. Uh, it's a very difficult group alongside uh, Brazil and Czechoslovakia. And they, they didn't progress, but they uh, played with distinction. And they uh, they, they very very impressive team. They impressed everybody with their professionalism and, and the quality of the of the football. So um, in that same year as well, I mean, we talk about European competition and um, Romanian clubs hadn't really made many inroads, but um, UT Arad, the textile team um, from, from the city of Arad, they drew Feyenoord, who, who were the Dutch champions and the European champions in 1970 in the first round of, of the European Cup and eliminated them. So it was the first time we'd ever seen a Romanian uh, club take a big scalp like that in European competition. So, I, I, again, that was in tandem with the, the progress made by the national team that was seen as, as um, a big step forward for, for the Romanian game. What would you say that was down to? They had good coaches, good players? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there was a generation of, of good players came through uh, and and the co- coaching is early. And the, the most famous coach, I mean, the, the, the coach of the 1970 team was... Um, uh, a chap called uh, Angelo Nicolescu, and he's he's a coach who's still revered by by modern tacticians to today. And he had his particular theories of temporization, when to speed up the game, when to slow down the game. So he was a thinker, and, and he was somebody who studied uh, football abroad with, with as, as as much as he, as he could with the limitations imposed upon him. Um, and another. Probably Hungary's, uh, sorry, Romania's most famous manager of, of the year was, was a fellow called Stefan Kovacs. And Kovacs had been a decent player and he had been a successful manager and he'd won titles as a, as a manager with Steaua Bucharest. But um, what was really, really unusual or was a surprise to everybody was um, when Ajax won the European Cup for the first time in 1971. They, they did that under Rinas Mikels, the, the famous Dutch coach. Uh, he went with the team with Coif and Naskins, a very famous team. Anyway, he left to take over Barcelona, and um, Ajax recruited this unknown Romanian, uh, Stefan Kovacs, and everybody was amazed that, um, that, that, that they would do this because he was very little known outside his own country. He was given special dispensation to, to leave, of course, and he was given a two-year uh, 
visa to, to go and work abroad and he coached me one further two European Cups with Ajax and he was a great success uh, and so he really advanced the kind of notion of, of, of remaining coaching and um, obviously when, when he, he his time at Ajax was over he had a short spell in charge of the French national team still the only foreign foreigner ever to coach the French national side and then he came back and he was very influential in you know continuing behind the scenes so despite the, the political shenanigans and despite the idiocy of Ceausescu, there was smart people uh, yeah. and, and, and there was good footballers, there were smart coaches. I wouldn't say there was good administrators, but um, in all of this happened despite Ceausescu and despite mm. the political system. And, and was Romania relatively unique in allowing sort of their coaches and uh, certainly their sports people to work abroad? I mean, I, I think of Ili Nastasi, for example, um, from the from from the tennis world, but I can't mm. think of and and then I'm not that that necessarily aware of Eastern European football during the Cold War. But whether any other Eastern Bloc coaches worked in the West? Well, very, yes, I mean very much so. I mean Romania, I would say probably the only um, R- Romania, East Germany, and Albania were the, probably the three nations of the three Eastern Bloc nations who were the most resistant to their people moving abroad in any form or, or other. I mean, Albania just didn't happen at all. Uh, East Germany and, and Romania, they, that happened, significantly started to happen as the economic climate of Romania worsened, of course, it started to happen through defections. But um, what tended to... But again, there was this kind of conflict of um, understanding that it was useful for coaches to work abroad and learn about different systems and different playing styles. But Kovacs, for example, was seen to be politically reliable. He had a family back home. He was seen as somebody who was not going to rock the boat. He wasn't going to make a fuss. He wasn't going to embarrass the regime. So a lot of it was down to vetting. Um, But, I mean, other countries, Yugoslavia, Hungary, Poles, that they... They, their coaches tended to go abroad much more readily than, than tended to happen in Romania, really. And, and particularly so as the, I mean, what you tended to find was liberalisation was, was forced upon these nations as time advanced. But Ceausescu was such a paranoid individual um, that the opposite, actually, probably by, by the time of his downfall in the late 1980s, Romania was a considerably less liberal nation than it had been when he'd taken, taken over in the 1960s. So it was a kind of reverse polarity there going on with, with him. Yeah, yeah. And I, you mentioned there was an age limit for, for players to to uh, play abroad. Was was that mm-hmm. ever changed if, you know, there was an opportunity for, I don't know, a hard currency or, or something like that in, in return for a player playing abroad? Well, there was a famous um, incident uh, in the early 70s, just so we're, we're just sort of moving forward a couple of years in time. And the first Romanian, proper Romanian modern day f- footballing superstar is a player who's probably not that, that well known to, um, to your listeners. His name was Nikolai Dobrin. And um, he's not famous because he never played for any of the major Western clubs. And, you know, he he, um, yeah, he, he didn't have the, the kind of career that good players have, have nowadays. He played the vast majority of his career in Potesti with um, the local club Argus. And they were a force in the game in the 70s for a while, um, primarily down to him. He was a kind of creative attacking midfielder. Very skillful, beautiful to watch. If you, you find some footage, there's some footage of him on YouTube, not very much, but um, you can see what a, what a wonderful player he was. Anyway, so Argus Potesti were champions of Romania and um, they drew Real Madrid in the European Cup, and this was 1971 72 season. And uh, Real Madrid prevailed, but very narrowly, and uh, Argus gave them a very, very difficult two games two, over two legs. And Dobrin was fantastic. And Santiago Bernabeu, who was the um, obviously the Real Madrid's president, he, he was very, very taken with, with Dobrin. And he contacted the regime and he was he wanted to buy him. He wanted to pay $2 million to, to, 
you know, to, to buy him. And uh, hard currency was always uh, a big thing for, for Ceausescu because, um, as as we talked about a little bit with, with East Germany, and one of the ways in which he made um, he brought in hard currency to the country was selling exit visas to um, Romanian to Israel and Germany. Obviously, there's a big German enclave within Romania, mm. uh, German speaking enclave, and um, so the German government would um, would buy out. The, the German-speaking people and, and uh, you know, rehouse them in West Germany. And the same happens with Israel as well. The, 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 most of the, the Romanian, the, the Jewish community around Romania, were um, bought out as such by Israel, and, and they were allowed to move to, uh, to to leave the country, and move move to Israel. So, people trading was very much one of his uh, preferred methods of uh, bringing in hard currency. So the opportunity to sell a, a footballer for a, a sizable amount of money, and in fact, um, Ceausescu himself conducted the negotiations with Santiago Bernabeu <laughs> over the potential transfer of, of, of this player. And um, it didn't happen in the end. He, decide, uh, he decided that um, it would, um, yeah, if, he, if he let one player go, then it would be very, very hard to kind of keep the finger in the dike, so to speak, and and stop other ones leaving at the time. So, so Dobran wasn't permitted to leave, um, and he had to play out the rest of his his time in in in, in Romania uh, with with Argus Potesti. And he wasn't especially resentful, but um, but but yeah, I mean, it's um, for the first time Romania had footballers who were cre- craved and, and uh, sought after by by big Western clubs, and um, Ceausescu was starting to discover. The, um, the temptations that, that, that were going to be there for those players and starting to, to find how difficult it was to, to keep his um, insular system <laughs> intact against the pressures from um, from, the, from, from the, the Western European game. Yeah. Did, did they have a problem with uh, players on international tour not returning? Goodness me. Uh, well, this became much more of a problem, yeah. I mean, by the time we sort of... If we move on a few years, time-wise, and we start to see um, the breakdown of of Romanian society, and I think a lot of this came down to the ruinous economic policies of, of Ceausescu and the ruinous policies, the social policies. Of course, there was the the nineteen sixty six policy that uh, he did, um, that him and Elena decided that uh, Romania, to be able to sustain its industrial base, needed a bigger population, so. Any sort of abortion was banned, and uh, all sorts of um, efforts were put in place to promote uh, families having as many children as possible. And, and um, you know, if you didn't have children or you only had one child, you were punitively taxed. So you know, the, you know, that was something that had a catastrophic effect in the social fabric of, of the country. The economic side of things was was ruinous as well. Um, and Ceausescu borrowed. Heavily, he was, he was given in quite a lot of financial grants and assistance from the West in, in his early days because they thought he was somebody that they could work with. So uh, he he ran up a huge foreign debt that he tried to invest in Romanian uh, in oil industry to expand that, and that was disastrous. When we, you had the um, collapse in oil prices in the mid nineteen seventies, and then of course he he started hanging around with the uh, with. China and North Korea, and he started to adopt some of the ideas of the Jewish, the, the kind of independence of North Korea. And uh, from 1977, I think it was onwards, he, he determined that um, Romania would repay all of its foreign debt, uh, which into, saw obviously the country enter this prolonged period of austerity uh, that drove down living standards to you know, calamitously low, low levels. So. So the country was starting to collapse, and, um, and his paranoia was, um, was 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 just you know co- it's almost kind of, kind of comical uh, for us if we look at it now, uh, but it must have been you know, quite horrible if you had to live through it. I mean, there, there was these laws, for example, if um, if a newspaper mentioned him, no one else but his wife could be named in the same paragraph. And if both him and Elena were mentioned in the paragraph, they had to both be on the same line of that paragraph. And then furthermore, uh, every page of a paper had to mention him a minimum of 40 times, and his name had to be in the specialised fonts. 
uh, and it's crazy. I'm just just checking back some some of the, 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 the stories as well. And in them, um, he once received a, a death threat, a, a written death threat, and he instructed the security at his infamous secret police to procure handwriting samples of every single citizen in the country to try to find out who had sent him sent him his death threats. You know, so. Um, Crazy, and, and you know, every every telephone manufactured in, in, in Romania came standard with with a bug in, embedded within it for, for surveillance purposes as well. So, um, and yeah, so, there's a there's definitely a uh, a few episodes worth um, oh, for me to cover Elena and Nikolai Ceausescu, without a doubt. Well, it just my, I mean, yeah, I mean, my favourite and, and contextual to football, I, I suppose. Here we, we talk about my favourite Elena. And I don't think she really had much interest in football, but for some reason she was put in charge of determining which football matches would be televised every week. Uh, goodness knows why, and goodness knows what a rationale for that was. But, but yes, uh, anyway. Um, so so yeah, so the, the, the economic collapse was was um, precipitous, and um, so by the time you, you started to get to the nineteen eighties, then we started to see um, defections, and, and defections was a, was a big thing we spoke about in these German episodes as well because um and, and and well i think it was a little bit different with east germany because with with east german players they were um very much exposed to what life in, in the west was like and um, west germany and, and and that counterpoint was was just too tempting for many of them and of course most of the players who did defect ended up in, in west germany west germany with romania it was different because it was it was absolute Poverty, really. Um, I mean, Romania was declining into becoming almost like a third world nation within a, a first world continent. Um, and the players, of course, were had the responsibilities of professionals, but, but, but the, pay of, uh, the, the pay of amateurs. So, I mean, yeah, we, we, we started to see um, quite a lot of notable defectors. Um, the saddest one, um, the most tragic one, was uh, a player called Dan Cole. And Danko was a, a defender. Uh, he played for Rapid Bucharest, and uh, he was a member of the 1970 World Cup team. He, he came from a, a, a well thought of family. I think his his father had been part of the part of, part of the, the, the the war effort, and he'd fought for the the communists. So yeah, he came. He he had a, a strong heritage, uh, and he was trusted in, in that respect. But. Um, so yeah, but 1971. Anyway, he um, he escaped. He managed to escape uh, from a game, and um, he found, made his way to Belgium. And he was given a contract with uh, with Antwerp. And um, so this took the, this. He was the first notable um, defecting player. Certainly, the first international player, I, I believe, who who defected. So um, the, the, the authorities were taken very much by, by surprise. He played there in Belgium for a couple of years, uh, and then he agreed to return uh, to Romania only if his safety was guaranteed, which it, which it was. So he came back, he was 31, and he wanted to go back to his former club and, and pick up his career at Rapid Bucharest. But, um, of course, he was never going to be allowed to do that. He had to be punished in, you know, directly and indirectly. Um, so he ended up uh, being being put, uh, he went to Galati in the second division and he, he played with them and then he retired and then he coached them and he won promotion for them, but he was there was a glass ceiling on him. The, the authorities were never going to let him um, progress. So then I move on a few years in 1980. Um, he requested and he was granted a short-term travel permit to Belgium under the pretext of visiting his, his old Antwerp colleagues. I'm surprised that was actually granted him, but, but it was anyway. And of course, this was just a ruse to escape again. And um, so he arrived in Belgium, made his way to West Germany, and he settled in Cologne as a political refugee. Um, so then, October, um, October 1981, this was, he was found hanged in his apartment. Um, and in the likelihood that it was suicide was was probably uh, was probably stripped away by the manner in which his, his body was found because his hands and his ankles were manacled to cuffs to suggest that he couldn't possibly have committed suicide and, and, and you know, it just wasn't physically impossible. And um, Dan Cole's big mistake, unlike some of the other defectors, was that he was very vocal about Ceausescu and about the regime that he left behind and he 
used to uh, speak regularly to Radio Free Europe. Um, and just a few days before his death, he had conducted an interview with Radio Free Europe uh, where he had lambasted Ceausescu and criticised the human rights and and um, and then yeah and and to, you know within a couple of days he was he was found dead and the the murder the nature of the murder was very much in keeping with um, the the modus operandi of the uh, the securitats who were operating with impunity around Europe at the time um, imposing brutal ret- retribution against any enemies of, of Ceausescu. Uh, so yeah, and that was one of the the most tragic tragic examples of um, of a player who went against Ceausescu and and was too vocal about it and um, lost his life. Right, right. And how how was the the uh, army? Well, is it? Sh- I'm not going to be able to pronounce. Sh- <laughs> what was it? Stewa. Um, Stairwa, yeah. Uh, think of it st- as in stair, climbing a set of stairs and W at the end, stairwa. <laughs> oh, okay. Stair, stairwa and and dynamo, how, how were they faring during this period? Well, I mean, the 60s, and they, they, they won uh, many trophies in, in the 60s and 70s, but there were other teams that had some success as well, and um, teams like UT Arad's, uh, I mentioned, I guess, Poteste with um, Nikolai Dobran, of course. Uh, in the late, then in the late 70s, you saw an emer- emergence of a, a really strong university, Craiova side as well, um, who were, they had some success. But um, I think when we hit the 1980s, this is when um, everything changed uh, quite considerably. And um, it, the, the, the Romanian football at that point gave up any pretense of being uh, a truly competitive environment, uh, and it became a vicious duopoly between Dinamo and, and Stewa. You had, um, after kind of crying over you know, Dinamo took over in the early 80s, and, and they were uh, a very, very powerful team under Mircea Lucescu, who I mentioned earlier, one of the, the great coaches. And um, I mean the, you know the, the machinations that went on with the um, between between the two clubs um, was <laughs> not the sort of type of thing that you you tended to see else, elsewhere. So whenever there was a there was a derby going on, for example, um, between the, the two clubs, um, then because Dinamo Bucharest were the team of the the Securitat, then. Um, that obviously gave them influence to all sorts of manner of un- underhand um, tricks to try to undermine their opponents as well. So, um, for example, like 1981, there was a, a player called Stefan Jovan, who was a talented defender, and Stor- uh, Stewa were close to signing him. But Dinamo Bucharest wanted to wanted to uh, wanted to acquire him. So they attempted to disrupt the deal, and their way of doing that, of course, was was by blackmailing the player. Over a woman that he had uh, he made pregnant two years earlier, and was was obviously a secret from from his wife as well. So, and then ahead of a, a derby against Stewa, um, the the police would um, disrupt the, the Stewa captain, uh, who's a, a, a player called Tudorel Stoika, by uh, by having the police back in his hometown of Galati uh, arrest his heavy drinking father and have him thrown in jail for the night as well. To Obviously, to distract him and take and take his focus off uh, off off the the, the, the game in hand. So, uh, and and the, the, every transfer, every deal to acquire players that became like this that became more of attrition between the two the, between the two clubs. Um, but the turning point, I think, was um, Dinamo very much of the upper hands, and, and in fact, even down to the, the Steyr's offices were were bugged by the security at, and they made a big uh, play of um, letting. So they were know that they knew all the tactics in advance because they listened listened into them. But what what changed uh, changed the playing fields was um, I think we moved to about nineteen eighty three now, and um, the, um, the the head of Stewart at, at the time, uh, who was the he was the head of the army ministry, um, he was a, a general called uh, Constantine Altianu. and he realised that um, I mean, this was all about influence, carrying influence. And um, he realised they were, were losing this battle. So in the hope of trying to turn the tide, he wanted to get the Ceausescu's involved, uh, which was, um, you know, like inviting, putting piranhas into your, your fish tank, really. 
And um, I mean, the, the, the Ceausescu's were never especially interested in football. Um, but anyway, Valentin, who was uh, one of Nikolai's sons, he took over. And Nikolai was a curious figure, um, unlike his other brother, one of his other brothers, Niku, who was um, a typical uh, playboy and he drove his car around um, drunk and running people over and his father having to smooth over his indiscretions. Uh, Valentin was more of a humble figure. He was um, trained as a nuclear physicist. He drove a Dacia and um, you know he was, a, he was a, a kind of quiet man. He had no experience as a football official. But um, apparently his um, dedication and his common sense earned him respect. And in fact, some of the Stairwell players later, you know, after the Ceausescu regime fell, spoke quite fondly of him. Um, so he, he, did, he came in as a, a general manager. But um, of course, that, that then changed uh, because being a Ceausescu meant that whatever he wanted to happen could happen. And um, the game... The game in Romania declined into well, it's a farce, really, um, because it became a fix. It became a, the duopoly that we, we spoke about. We, we had zombie clubs making up the other places um, at the behest of of, of the, the powers that be. Um, but curiously, despite all of the corruption that, that, that took over the, the standard of football and the successes that that um, of Romanian football in the in the nineteen eighties. Uh, continue to blossom, which is uh, an, incre- an incredible dichotomy that I just couldn't begin to explain how that could possibly have happened. But, yeah, but it did. Because if they're not playing against well properly competitively, yeah, it makes mm. you wonder how, how they would perform well against uh, other international sides. But I understand there was a, a European Cup success. They started. I mean, Romanian clubs had made little impact in European club competition before the 1980s, but um, when that did start to start to change, uh, University of Craiova they reached a UEFA Cup semi final uh, in 1983. Dinamo Bucharest they reached the European Cup semi final in '84, and narrowly lost to Liverpool that year. And um, and then yes, Steaua, of course, who went went better still and they actually won the European Cup in 1986 uh, which was incredible uh, I, I mean I, I remember at the time I was only 18 at the time and they were the, the first the one of only two Eastern Bloc uh, Eastern European teams to win the European Cup the second one would be Red Star Belgrade just uh, at, at when Yugoslavia collapsed a few years later in 1991 but uh, still were the first to win there'd only ever been one Eastern European team had even reached a European Cup final before, which was um, Partizan Belgrade back in 1966. And uh, yeah, and then this was a team who, um, as soon as Valentin took over, basically assumed con- total command of um, Romanian football. And they, they, they I mean, they, they had a 104 game unbeaten run domestically from the start of the 1986 season right the way through to the town. The, the, the regime fell and this was down to dodgy refereeing it was down to referees playing on as long as it needed for Steaua to find a goal you know offside goals given f- for them you know, perfectly good goals by opponents disallowed so yeah not a competitive environment um, at all you would you would think when they, they basically just had to, to run out onto the pitch and they were guaranteed to, to win all, the, all of the league games but they had a, a fine team uh, and it managed to, to go all the way in, in Europe and the, in the European Cup in 1986, they, they reached the final. They were very much uh, second favourites. They were playing Barcelona um, and Barcelona managed by Terry Venables at the time. And the game was played in Seville as well. So it was virtually a, a home game for Barcelona. And um, it was one of the worst European Cup finals I've ever seen. I, to, I think everybody would say that. It was nothing each. There was barely a shot in target the whole game. It went to penalty kicks. And um, there was a uh, famous keeper, uh, Helmut Dukadam, uh, saved four kicks. And, uh, and Stero won 2-0 in the penalty shootout. And, and they became Romania's uh, first ever, uh, only ever, European trophy winners. So yeah, it was absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. You describing Romanian football in the 1980s makes East German 
football that we described in the previous episode seem quite a uh, fair and level playing field. Well, I mean, it was. I mean, we we'll, we'll can talk a little bit about the, 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 what I tend to be the, the zombie clubs, but um, one of them was this was a club called Victoria Bucharest. And um, this was a club that had been around in various different guises for, for decades. And they'd always been a, like a, a B team for, for Dinamo primarily. But um, while this duopoly was, was going on, it, it was almost like um, Dinamo introduced this team. They, 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 they were promoted back up into the, to, into the top division for the first time in 1985. And then every year after that, they finished in third place. Um, they would never beat Stewa. They'd never beat Dinamo. Stewa were always first. Dinamo were always second. Victoria Bucharest were always third. <laughs> Every uh, each of those four seasons up until the end of the Ceausescu regime, that Victoria were in the top the top division. They uh, would reach the cup semi final, um, and they would lose uh, four times in successive seasons to Dinamo Bucharest. And every time they would lose by a two goal margin. Sometimes it was two 0 Sometimes it was four two. But they, so uh, yeah, uh, everything was hierarchical. Everything was ordered, uh, and um, yeah, yeah it, it was it, it was a farce. And for a team uh, for, from such still considered to be obviously a soccer outpost to become champions of Europe and, and from this uh, from this background was was incredible. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So. What what happened with the sides with the fall of Ceausescu? Well, um, I mean, I, I'll just mention just when we're talking about this, the, um, the the stagnant state of the domestic game. I mean, I may, I'm, I'll just tell you a little bit about um, another of the <laughs> clubs that didn't outlive, outlive the Ceausescu regime because Victoria Bucharest didn't outlive them. Um, they were they were shut down within months of. Um, of Ceausescu being being executed, uh, another club was a club called uh, FC Alt Skonicesk, and uh, Skonicesk for your Ceausescu scholars out there uh, was is a village, a tiny village, um, which happened to be the birthplace of Nikolai Ceausescu himself. Hmm. And um, yeah, so this 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 was a team. Uh, well, this was a town, a village of six thousand people, and. Um, it was, it was also one of the towns, villages that was uh, chosen for Ceausescu's policy of systemization, and this was the um, part of his indus- rapid industrialization program in the seventies that involved uh, basically raising down everything old and replacing it with with uh, more uh, industrial friendly mid rise apartment blocks, for example. Um, so uh, and and Ceausescu was part of the, the, the wanting to raise the, the the amount of working population he had in the country as well. You know he he plans this to be one of the many times where the population would would uh, would rise as well. So so he ended up um, in this little village and um, everybody everybody's houses everybody's farms were bulldozed and they were put into apartment blocks. And in fact, the only old building that existed in Skonicesk was uh, Ceausescu's birthplace which was uh, unsurprisingly allowed to um, allowed to allowed to stand but anyway they, they had a football team as well and started in the early 70s and um, it started to obviously progress to, towards the, um, the the late 1970s up towards the the, the, the top of the, the remaining game and in, in slightly uh, in a slightly kind of comical fashion as well um, so uh, yeah Scone Chesk were chasing promotion uh, to the Top flight for what would have been the first time, and on the last day of the season, they uh, they had to play a club called Electrodo Slatina, and they had to win by a goal margin equal to or more than um, another club called Flacara Moreni, who were another state club. Then erroneously informed that Flacara were winning nine nil, and that actually they were winning three nil. Um, Ceausescu's team up the ante and ended up winning this game eighteen nil. <laughs> And what happened, there was no phone line connecting the villages where Steo and, and Flacara Morena were, were playing. So men with hand radios were stationed at intervals between the ground, relaying garbled scores like, like Chinese whispers, uh, which led to this slightly comical situation. And a- after the referee blew for full time and the teams found, found off the pitch, the, um, the chairman of um, Skonicesk, he actually went, got the players out of the, the shower, 
got the referee, took them all back onto the pitch and made them play on to score a few more goals just to make sure that um, they had enough goals to to, to win by. Uh, so, yeah, so it was uh, 18 nils to score. It was 1 nil at half time and 17 goals in the second half. So, uh, and that was a very typical. In Scotland Chess, they went up to, I think they finished, uh, I mean, this was a time, they were the first village ever to play in the top flight of, of, of Romanian football. And uh, they finished, I think, in 1982, they finished as high as fourth, um, again, because they were seen as an institution club. But the, the, the irony was that Ceausescu himself wasn't ever really that interested in football or his own club. And in fact, it was his brother-in-law who was the communist uh, general secretary there, who was uh, he was the, the main influence in the rise in Scottish Chess. And obviously he had a lot of influence himself to bring to bear to, to take the club as, as, as high as they did. And I mean, the most ridiculous thing about the the the, the, the old Scotland story was um, this was a time that even after this, the systemization process, uh, his population never really topped out more than about ten thousand. But um, the general secretary uh, Barbalescu, he um, he decided in the mid nineteen eighties that uh, this this was a, a town or this was a village and a football club that needed an international class stadium. And they built a 30,000 capacity stadium, which um, was uh, at the time the second biggest in, in Romania and certainly one of the most advanced in, in, in facility facility wise. Then, obviously, within four years, Scona Chess were closed down um, because they were seen as a <laughs> as a Ceausescu club. Uh, the team folded, a new club opened, a new club started and, and played in, in their, their played in their position. Uh, down in the fourth or fifth tier of the remaining game, and, and now that thirty thousand stadium, uh, we're lucky if they see crowds of about sixty or seventy at, at home games. Wow, wow! Have you ever been there to uh, watch a game? No, um, it's it's a way out in the middle of, of nowhere. In fact, but some of the players who were assigned there um, to, to to go and play for them, and, and they had some good players, of course, and, and they're very famous Romanian player called Victor Paturka, who's, who's one of the Romanian greats. He, he started his career there and he spent four seasons. And uh, and, and it was literally a one-horse town. Um, there was one cafe that all of the players used to sit and drink and bemoan that how they had ended up in this this muddy hellhole because apparently it was one of, <laughs> there was only one half, one, one attempt at a road and... Um, for whatever reason, that the whole town was just mud. Everywhere was mud and concrete. And um, you, you, they said they'd sit in the cafe and they would watch and they could sit for two or three hours and not see a single car go past. <laughs> so, um, so I think yeah, it's, 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 it's uh, uh, we're in the middle of nowhere. And um, I think if you've travelled to Romania, you're not getting around anywhere, but public transport is hard enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, getting between the major <laughs> major centres. Yeah, I think if you're going to try and get to Scotland, you might struggle. Yeah, yeah. So with with the fall of Ceausescu, what 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 happens then to these? Uh, obviously, some of these uh, clubs uh, disappear. But what about the um, uh, Dinamo and Ster Ster Sterwa Sterwa? I got it in the end. Well, Victoria, Victoria Bucharest went, and Old Skoniecki uh, and Skoniecki they went. It looked like Dinamo Bucharest were going to go as well because they were so strongly affiliated to the the, the Securitat and the, the Ministry of the Interior, who had committed all sorts of heinous crimes against against the population. In the, in the early days after um, after Ceausescu's execution. The club tried to preempt that, and they changed the name to Unirea Chikula, which was one of the clubs, uh, the pre-war clubs that had been part of, that had been merged into another club to become Dinamo in, in the first place. But then, what tended to happen, <laughs> and this is very typical of Romanian life in general, was that after the huge upheaval of the first few months following the the revolution, um, I think people started to realise it. Apart from getting rid of Ceausescu and his wife, it wasn't really a, a huge um, revolution at all because the same people uh, who had been in positions of power before uh, or during the 1980s and, and during communist era tended to find themselves uh, in positions of power in, in the years that followed as well. And that, whether, that was, um, uh, whether that was in government or, or in fact, in, in, in football as well. And um, the, chairman, uh, the chairman I mentioned... Um, 
at Skonichesk, who who was um, behind the fixing of that club. But he was um, he also was the chair of the president of Victoria Bucharest, another discredited club, uh, and he was also president of Flakari Moreni, who were another discredited club, and yet he became the head of the Romanian Football Federation uh, for over a decade in the 90s and into the early 2000s. So so um, the upheaval kind of went away a little bit, and um, I think people realised that um, it, it was quite similar, I think, in East Germany as well, with it, um, with, uh, with uh, uh, Dimo Berlin, um, and immediately the club changed its name because it wanted to put distance between itself and its roots. But then it kind of realised that it, had, <laughs> it carried a certain brand value and um, Dinamo Bucharest carried a significant yeah. brand value uh, having been you know, a force in Europe. So it, it prevailed and yeah. it continues and to this day. Still, we were never really under any threats of, um, of, of, of change at the, at the time. And they, despite the, the Valentin... Yeah, school, because the presumably because they were the army club... And the army was really the um, the people who brought Ceausescu down. Yeah, I, I think there was that that association. They managed to separate out the, the Ceausescu affiliation and, and, and the yeah. influence that they had, um, and uh, yeah, to fair to the, the army side of that process, definitely. As you can hear, Craig really knows his stuff and I highly recommend a visit to his website Beyond the Last Man for numerous Cold War football stories. We have a link to his site and various Romanian football videos in our show notes. This will also show as a link in some podcast apps. Don't forget, if you'd like to get that Cold War Conversations coaster and keep us on the air, head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. Or again, click on the link in your podcast app. If you can't wait for the next episode, head over to our Facebook discussion group where our guests and listeners, just like you, continue the Cold War conversation. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. <laughs>